bi-monthly webinar series is hosted by uh, NIDIS, CERC, and the Northwest Climate Hub. It is designed to provide stakeholders in the Pacific Northwest with timely drought and climate information. Each webinar is tailored to reflect recent, current, and forecasted conditions and climatic events, and also includes discussions of observed impacts and other relevant updates from across the region. A recording of the webinar will be posted on drought.gov later this week, and PDFs of the presentations can be accessed by emailing uh, Britt Parker, the Pacific Northwest Dues Coordinator. Uh, just to note, after today's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to provide us feedback um, that will help us improve the webinar series. So please take a moment and let us know what you think. Uh, today's speakers include uh, John Abbasaglu, a CERC researcher at the University of Idaho. He'll give us the climate recap and current conditions. Then Andrea Baer with the National Weather Service Western Region Office will present the climate outlook. And next, we have Tim Cook, with the Washington State Emergency Management Division, who will speak about drought mitigation. And finally, Adrian Marshall with the University of Idaho will present research on climate change and snow. Uh, during the presentation, please use the chat box to ask questions, and we can address them during the question and answer period after all the presentations. Um, if we have time in between, we'll squeeze the questions in, but otherwise we'll save them till the end. So before we move into the presentation, uh, we'll highlight partners that make the webinar series happen. So first, the Pacific Northwest Climate Impacts Research Consortium, or CERC, is a climate science to climate action team funded by NOAA's Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessment Program. CERC supports communities, policymakers, and resource managers in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho and Western Montana as they work to adapt to changing climate by transforming the latest climate science and data into usable knowledge. Uh, second, the Northwest Climate Hub develops and delivers science-based region-specific technologies and practical information that will assist agricultural and natural resource managers with, with climate-informed decision-making. And then to highlight NIDIS, I'll turn it over to Britt Parker. Thank you, Megan. As Megan mentioned, I'm the um, Pacific Northwest Dues Regional Coordinator with NIDIS, and NIDIS's mission is to improve the nation's capacity to proactively manage drought-related risks by providing those affected with the best available information and resources to assess the potential for drought and to better prepare for, mitigate, and respond to the effects of drought. We want to improve our understanding of how and why drought affects society, the economy, and the environment, and to improve improve accessibility, dissemination, and use of early warning information for drought risk management. NIDIS's approach to achieve that goal is to build the foundation of a national dues or drought early warning system through the development of regional dues, where networks of partners and stakeholders share information and actions that can help communities cope with drought. While the ultimate goal is a national early warning system, we recognize that impacts and early warning information differ across the regions. Each dues has many of the same base ingredients, but ultimately have their own flavor to reflect the needs of their region. The Pacific Northwest dues was officially launched in February of 2016, and our strategic plan is available on drought.gov. Please note we are in the process of updating this strategy now, and uh, we will be sending out an information, uh, excuse me, an email in the next month or so for those who want to take a look at the strategic plan before it is finalized. So be looking for that information. Mark your calendars. Our next webinar is April 27th of 2020. Registration information for these and other webinars can be found on the drought.gov calendar. Also, the next water supply forecast monthly briefing from the North River Northwest River Forecast Center will be held on March 5th. And these monthly water supply briefings are held from January through late spring on the first Thursday of each month. You can register by looking for the entry on the March 5th date on drought.gov calendar or Google the NWRFC water supply forecast briefing. To facilitate our early warning system, more precipitation observations are needed. We encourage you to join COCORAS, the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. This is a unique nonprofit community-based network of volunteers for all ages and backgrounds, working together to measure and map precipitation, rain, hail, and snow, as well as the condition reporting. Observations by Coco Ross observers of precipitation events or the lack thereof are important to capture and improve our understanding of weather. 
I have the Coco Ross contacts for each state up on the screen now, and I will also put those in the chat box in a moment. To become a volunteer, please learn and learn more. Please visit CocoRoss.org. All right, uh, thanks, Britt. Uh, so next, uh, we'll turn it over to the climate recap with John Abbasabu. Okay, thanks, Megan and Britt. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a play-by-play -play in terms of what has transpired over the last couple of months here across the Northwest. We have certainly seen a whiplash in terms of our drought uh, status and uh, just to highlight that i'll start by showing us a set of three maps and this is just showing us the drought u.s drought monitor from a year ago um in the middle this is from basically the start of 2020 and then on the right this was from last week and so what we can see here is that we certainly um have drought across the northwest which may be remarkable given how much precipitation has fallen over the past uh six to seven weeks um and what is also interesting is that we've we've actually still we've actually still have uh, we actually have a, sort of a, a sort of an increase in sort of drought intensity in parts of the region so i'm going to hit on these two main features in terms of where we've gone from basically the start of 2020 to where we are now and I'll, I'll start by basically bringing us back to where we were on January 1st of 2020. And this is a product that is updated monthly by um, uh, Scripps in US East San Diego. And it's basically showing us the probability, the odds of water year 2020 reaching 100%, reaching normal precipitation by the end of the water year. And things looked pretty grim, right? That sort of all these, these, these like red and sort of white hues across the Northwest suggested that there was really low probability of actually getting back to normal by the end of the water year. Um, this was January 1st. If we looked at a map like this now, things would look very, very different because we have seen a remarkable recovery in terms of uh, precipitation accumulation, particularly across a few key areas in the Northwest. And just to highlight this, this is showing us um, one of the tools from the Northwest Climate Toolbox. Um, and you can go in and sort of choose your location. This is showing us a trace in red for the accumulative uh, water year precipitation in Mount Rainier. And you can see just how far below normal we were on uh, basically the start of 2020. And basically over the last, again, six to eight weeks, we've recovered and actually have recovered such that we're actually in pretty good shape. So in terms of the last 60 days, temperature and precipitation percentiles, both of these are from the, the climate toolbox. Temperatures have been um, relatively normal a few areas of above normal um january was actually quite a bit above normal and i'll highlight that a bit um overall temperatures have been you know not super remarkable there's one attribute of temperature that I'll, I'll remark on at the end that has been actually notable the more interesting story is precipitation and here we're looking at the precipitation percentile the last 60 days compared to the same 60 day period over the past 40 years and we can see that there are a few areas of um, record precipitation. In other words, this is the most precipitation that we've seen over this 60 day period in the last four years. And that's highlighted here across much of Western Washington, parts of um, Northwestern Oregon, um, basically from the Cascade Crest to the coast. And then a nice swath here over the Blues and Wallawas and then much of Northern Idaho. Um, what is also, also also interesting is despite how wet it's been, there's actually been a few areas of below normal and you know, even decently below normal precipitation just in the lee of the Cascades. And then also in Southern Idaho, parts of Southern Idaho and like the Big Wood River um, Basin. And so if we look at sort of total precipitation for the current water year, so from October 1st through present, um, we actually see that there is a reason that we still have drought in the Northwest that's showing up on the U.S. drought monitor maps. And that's, it's still, we were so far below normal in terms of precipitation um, heading into the start of 2020 that even though we've seen a lot of precipitation, um, there's still areas that, that are still lagging. Um, nonetheless, 
drought abatement has certainly occurred across much of western Washington and parts of um, parts of parts of northern Idaho as well. So I wanted to highlight just a few areas that I or a few stations that have had pretty pretty epic precipitation. And um, one is Meacham, Oregon, and the reason that I'll actually emphasize this is we've seen some we've seen some really impressive flooding on the Umatilla River um, that had some impacts in Pendleton. And um, Meacham has seen at least for the first uh, first half first whatever eight weeks of the uh, eight weeks of 2020 they've seen almost 18 inches of precipitation, and that is pretty close to where they would typically get by the time we see by the time we get into basically June in terms of um, calendar year precipitation. Um, by the way, this sort of this this sequence here of around 40 days from around sort of you know January 10th up until February 18th or so. Um, from each Morgan, this was the 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 period at least the, the wettest 40 days that they've ever seen in their period of record. So you can make some references to Noah's Ark, uh, Noah's floods. Um, we actually see a similar feature here from the Quileute Airport um, in the Olympics, where they've seen, they saw about 40 inches of precipitation in 40 days. Um, this is a very wet place, of course. So a few areas have seen some really, really impressive precipitation totals. Um, and it's quite a contrast from where we were a year ago, talking about some of the impacts on the ground. And certainly in February of 2019, we were talking about record lowland snow in places like Seattle. Um, this year, we've seen a really impressive amount of precipitation falling. Um, one thing that's quite interesting, though, is that in terms of snowpack, we haven't seen very much lowland snow this year, certainly nowhere near as what we saw last year. And this is showing us um, a map of the differences in, in, in snow, sweet snow water equivalent from SNODAS, and this, is, this can be ginned up through Climate Engine. This is just showing us uh, 2020 minus 2019. And so anywhere in green here is basically depicting areas where we actually have more snow this year than last year, and anywhere in brown is where we have less snow this year than last year. So the good news here is that we don't have a bunch of lowland snow, but we certainly do have a lot of snow up high in the mountains. And that'll be important, certainly when we're talking about hydrologic impacts um, um, come spring and summer. Um, in terms of our snow water equivalent percentiles, these are um, also on the climate toolbox. Uh, this is data from Vic showing us that we basically have um, pretty close to average uh, snow water equivalent, some areas of above average, some areas of below average. Probably the areas of below average that are most concerning are across much of the sort of the south southern portion of Idaho and the Big Wood River area where we have some snow water equivalent values that are quite low. And this is an area that has seen below normal precipitation. So like I mentioned before, temperature has been um, at least over the last uh, six, two months or so, it's been somewhat above normal, but not remarkable. January was quite warm. The one thing that has been remarkable this year is that we've really avoided any significant colder outbreak. And so looking at the single coldest nighttime low this year or this uh, this winter so far, um, we've only seen temperatures of 27 in Portland. Um, I think something similar in Seattle. And it, it's basically the second warmest uh, coldest night, if you will. Um, on record at these locations. So um, quite interesting there, even though the temperatures themselves are not, you know, we're not talking about records on that on that side. Um, I wanted to take just a, a couple stabs here at providing a little bit of the why. Um, and so January and February are certainly wet months of the year. They're not the wettest months of the year in the Northwest. And typically what happens in January and February is that the, the jet stream and storm track splits its time between the Northwest and the Southwest. And so this is showing us the 300 millibar winds, more or less the storm track for an average um, January 1st to February 20th, right? And so this jet stream goes Northwest and Southwest. This is this year, right? And so the big difference here is that we have actually seen a very, very persistent zonal jet um, across the northwest and essentially what's happening here is that the jet stream has decided to basically avoid the southwest 
direct all those storms into the Northwest. And so we've seen a, a virtual conga line of storms across the Northwest and very zonal flow. And that explains a lot of the spatial patterns in precipitation with um, pretty high amounts of precipitation on the windward slopes and actually below normal um, in the leeward slopes of the region. Um, there is no very strong ENSO signature to talk about, and you'll hear more about that um, following my talk. Um, and I'll throw my hands in the air a little bit on ter in terms of why we've seen this pattern. Um, we have certainly seen a jet stream that has been directed much further north than typically is for this time of the year. Um, and it turns out that globally, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, we have seen over the last two months a very strong persistent phase, positive phase of the Arctic Oscillation. And this is essentially cold air being bottled up at the poles and the mid latitudes being relatively warm, the jet stream being very strong and zonal and shifted a bit further north. Um, so it fits into the pattern here. Um, it's a little bit premature to blame necessarily the Arctic Oscillation, the positive phase of the Arctic Oscillation on what we've seen, but it is part of a global sort of global phenomenon that's going on this particular year. So to summar summarize here, we've seen a, a pretty nice comeback um, in terms of precipitation. This persistent storm track has funneled systems, and I didn't really talk about some of the atmospheric rivers, but we've certainly seen our share of them. Um, the, the temperatures have been relatively mild, but for midwinter, that's still good enough for allowing our snow to build up in the mountains, but it's also been good for keeping the snow out of the lowland areas. And the good news here is that even though we still have drought across parts of the Northwest, we've alleviated many of the hydrologic drought concerns because our wet areas have actually seen um, pretty decent amounts of precipitation across most of the region. So I will end there and pass it on. All right, thank you, John. Uh, we'll go on next to Andrea. Yes, just a moment here. Sorry, I had to bring this back up. <laughs> okay, can you see my slides and hear me okay? That looks good. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so like John just said, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what's going on uh, with El Nino and or La Nina or not, <laughs> um, and a little bit about the Climate Prediction Center's climate and drought outlooks coming up for the next couple weeks and season. So right now things are um, a little bit strange um, with um, with El Nino, La Nina. Um, we're we're actually in ENSO neutral conditions, meaning neither El Nino or La Nina. However, the sea surface temperatures in the tropical Pacific remain warm, and I said that to you all on the December call as well. If you were on that call. They were hovering right on that sweet spot that we look for um, in the ocean uh, to declare an El Nino. Uh, and I'll go over a little bit about why we're not declaring an El Nino, even though the sea surface temperatures are, are hovering right there uh, above normal in what we typically would look for for El Nino. Um, let's see, moving on. Okay. So these are the weekly sea surface temperatures, and the um, area that we look for is this Nino 3.4 area, and we're looking for about 0 0.5 degrees C above normal to start looking for El Nino conditions. And you can see we're a little bit above that. If you average those over the months, and um, I'll show you that in the next slide, things again are right on the edge there of El Nino and Enso neutral, but you can see we've been pretty warm since late September going up and down there in that tropical Pacific area. This is a history uh, going back to about 2007 and the areas that are shaded in pink are seasons where we have had El Nino conditions. When they're shaded in blue, that's La Nina and gray is and so neutral. You can see this past October, November, December was right on that threshold of positive 0.5. And then moving into November, December, and January, we were positive 0.6 degrees C. And it looks like uh, when we get the December, January, February, we'll probably, January, excuse me, December, January, and February, February gosh, I can't say February, um, we'll be right around this area too. So right on the edge, like I've been saying. 
Um, here are the sea surface temperature departures, and you can see pretty warm uh, sea surface temperature departures along uh, the Dateline um, equator area, and then more mostly uh, average um, as you get into the eastern Pacific. When you look down at the below the below the surface of the sea surface temperature area, you can see that this is about uh, zero to about 300 meters down. You can see we've been pretty warm since September, and I'll show you why that's happening in just a minute. Um, so this slide will show that. There have been a series of what are called um, downwelling Kelvin waves, and they're big waves that move through the Pacific Ocean. And when they push across the Pacific Ocean, they bring those warm waters from the west. And these dashed lines right here indicate those downwelling Kelvin waves. So you can see one was initiated um, mid-January into February. And here's the date line right here. So if you were traveling along the equator, here's the date line. And then you get over to the South American coast right around in here. So you can see we've had a couple of those. They've been um, on the weaker side, so they haven't warmed the ocean um, too much, but they have kept the ocean warm. One thing I do want to point out after talking with the Climate Prediction Center is what we really need is the tropical uh, Pacific Ocean to be uh, above average. But we also need the atmosphere to be reflecting um, El Nino conditions in order to call it an El Nino. And that's not happening. We're not seeing that storminess that we typically would look for um, and the winds that we typically look for. We're not seeing a lot of that. And most of all, we're not seeing a lot of impacts. So they are keeping the forecast at ENSO neutral. You will see in the forecast the January, February, and March season um, yes, we'll be slightly warm, but again, expecting that to cool down a bit and things to look more um, neutral both in the atmosphere and in the ocean. And then next fall, a um, little bit of hint at, at um, more of a chance of La Nina, but still and so neutral is the, the favored category for next fall. But I wouldn't put a whole lot into that, um, or excuse me, summer into fall. I wouldn't put a whole lot into that quite yet. Um, these are the summer months here, and this is as we move into fall. Here is the uh, forecast plan from the International Research Institute and NOAA's Climate Prediction Center. Again, if you'll look at this blue line, this thick green line, and the thick red line, everything looking to, uh, to move back into a firm neutral category as we uh, move through the spring and into the summer. Looking out at the six to 10 day forecast, uh, this is from the Climate Prediction Center. This came out uh, yesterday, Sunday, so they will be updated in about an hour. There will be a few changes, but um, it will overall look a lot like this. Uh, but I couldn't put the new forecast in because they were still tweaking those. So um, I just picked Spokane as, as my area to, um, uh, to look at, but basically um, in this area right here, just a, a slight tilt in the odds uh, for the next, um, for the forecast from February 29th to March 4th, slight tilt in the odds for above normal temperatures, and then really not much to say, um, equal chances for the precipitation, meaning um, there's nothing in our forecast models giving the forecasters confidence uh, one way or the other at this time in above average precipitation below or near normal. And you can get to this interactive display um, from CPC's uh, website. This is on the front page and, and I'm just uh, clicking on interactive here and that'll give you these interactive uh, maps with the pie charts. And here's the 18 day, uh, to 14 day forecast and that's for March 2nd through Sunday, March 8th. And uh, really just a slight tilt in the odds still for above normal temperatures for much of the Pacific Northwest, not much to say for the western side of the Pacific Northwest. And again, I'm sorry, not much to tell you uh, for much of the Pacific Northwest uh, for precipitation, just a slight uh, tilt in the odds for above normal precipitation once you get into the eastern side of Washington, Oregon, and, and um, 
no, actually, excuse me, that's into Idaho, I'm sorry, and into uh, the western side of Montana. Washington and Oregon are out of that. But a slight tilt for in the odds for below normal in uh, the southwest corner of Oregon. And then looking at weeks three and four outlooks, looking cooler uh, than average for uh, the northern part of the Pacific Northwest, and then uh, below normal for weeks three and four. And this is for about March 7th through the 20th. So below normal um, for the uh, much of Washington and Oregon for those uh, weeks three and four outlook. Looking at the one month, there's a, a tilt in the odds towards below normal for the month of March for much of the Pacific Northwest with the exception of um, the southern half of Idaho. And then not much to say about temperatures equal chances there. And then for the seasonal, for the seasonal, if we look at temperatures, uh, just slight tilt in the odds for above normal temperatures for much of Washington and Oregon and southern Idaho. And then equal chances for precipitation for much of the Pacific Northwest, with the exception of below normal favored for the southeastern portion of Oregon. And as we look at the uh, drought outlook, it looks like we are um, the brown and yellow categories, which brown is meaning drought will persist and uh, yellow is drought development is likely. So we're seeing that in that area where John was showing you, we didn't have a whole lot of um, precipitation like the western side and um, more of the eastern side of the state had this whole central area of Washington and Oregon um, still hurting a bit with, with um, precipitation and expected to continue and then also into Idaho. And here is the seasonal forecast and that's valid from February 20th to May 31st. And again, looking like um, drought development is likely pushing uh, closer to that border with California. So with that, I will pass it back to you guys. All right, thank you, Andrea. And we can next turn it over to Tim Cook. Thank you. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes, we can. All right, let me, let me get this going here. Sorry. There we go. And then let me hide that. Oh. <laughs> Can you see my screens okay? Yes, we can see your screen just fine. All right, great. I was looking at the uh, GoToWebinar um, panel on the corner, so I was, wasn't sure if you guys were seeing that as well. Nope. Okay. Well, thank you for this opportunity to uh, talk about drought mitigation uh, with you all. My name's Tim Cook, State Hazard Mitigation Officer. I work at Emergency Management Division. And um, my primary job is to help communities access FEMA mitigation grants to do mitigation projects for hazards, natural hazards that they've identified in their planning process. So this, this is a, a great opportunity for me to highlight one of the projects that have been submitted um, through my office to FEMA recently that we're excited about that I think speaks to um, multi-hazard considerations when you're planning and um, projects with co-benefits. So before I go to the uh, example, I, I wanna highlight a couple things. On the, on the right and left-hand corners of the slide there, you see two uh, plans or covers of plans, one being the state's drought contingency plan. Um, yes, we have one of those in Washington, which is very nice. It's managed by the Department of Ecology and it goes over all kinds of really good higher level um, drought definitions, considerations, um, and it includes the Washington statutory definition of a drought. We actually have the definition of drought in state law. And as you see in the center of the screen there, it's two conditions. Uh, when those two conditions are met, um, the governor can, by law, declare a drought emergency for the area that meets those conditions. So water supply for the area would be below 75% of normal and uh, water users in the area would uh, incur undue hardships due to the water shortage. Um, and then on your left-hand side, you see our Washington State Enhanced Hazard Mitigation Plan. 
that's that's a document that my office updates and and procures. It's approved by FEMA, and uh, it is a multi-hazard plan, and it it includes one of the highlighted uh, hazards is drought. So here you have, uh, you're probably all familiar with this, a very schooled audience I'm speaking to, <laughs> uh, an annual average precipitation map of Washington. And it's about what you would expect, right? You, on the east side of the mountains, it's fairly arid and dry. On the west side of the mountains, it's notoriously wet and damp and soggy. Um, and the, as the drought contingency plan and our state enhanced plan talks about, there, in Washington, there's really three flavors of drought. Um, I know this is fairly simplistic, but just for context here, I thought I'd go over it briefly. Uh, the first type of drought we see is low precipitation during the winter months when we typically um, receive a lot of our precipitation. Second type of drought would be hot and dry summer months. And then the third type of drought is warm winter temperatures. And that's an interesting one to me as, as a more of a, a non-drought subject matter expert, but because your precipitation levels could be the same, really. You could get normal or average precipitation levels, but since there was warmer temperatures, you're not getting that snowpack. And I know we're gonna have a great presentation on, on, on snowpack and stuff, but so our snow dominant watersheds are extremely affected by the third type of drought. And I wanted to highlight one of those. Um, many of you from out of state might not know, there is a, a dry spot in Western Washington. I'll give you a second to maybe you've looked at the map and spotted it already, um, but it's thanks to the Olympic rain shadow uh, here on our Olympic Peninsula. Um, you see that little spot I've circled there. The color code in indicates it's on par with much of the eastern part of our state, and, and it certainly stands alone in the western part of our state. And that is the Dungeness River watershed, and the town there is the city of city of Squim, and that's there's a project there and a community there that I'd like to highlight today because I think it's a, instructive of our topic. So Squim has, a, of course, a very unique drought profile when you look at its neighbors to really any direction around it. Um, annual precipitation, I'm saying 13 inches there. That's a little low. It's probably closer to it's certainly 16 inches or less on average rainfall a year, comparable to Spokane, comparable even to Los Angeles. Um, by comparison, for context, you know, no, Seattle, known for its rain, gets about 38 inches. That's nothing compared to just west of Squim, further out on our peninsula, um, where Forks gets about 119 inches. And then, of course, you can find whole rainforests in areas that ex well exceed that amount. Um, so Squim's multi-hazard mitigation plan, its community plan, which is embedded in the broader county plan, prioritizes um, initiatives to reduce risk for both flood and drought. They have both issues um, to deal with. And, and I want to highlight one of the mitigation actions that were identified in their mitigation planning effort recently uh, to capture stormwater and reinfiltrate using green infrastructure to benefit the watershed. And that really is going to be the heart of my example here. Uh, drought mitigation goal overall, of course, and for this watershed is to create a redundancy of water resources. Uh, the Dungeness River itself, the watershed, is a, a beautiful neck of the woods. Uh, it's a snowpack dominant watershed. The entire Dungeness River from source to sea is only 28 miles. So a lot of that good fresh water during snowmelt, it, it, it runs fast and dumps into the salt water um, oftentimes before it has an opportunity to um, naturally uh, soak down into the aquifers that the city and the farmers rely on. Um, so, of course, localized climate change impacts less snowpack equals less snowmelt flow in the river, which has cascading effects, less recharge to the aquifers for drinking water, less irrigation water, of course, for the farms, and also less streamful for migrating salmon and wildlife. This is a, this is a river that originates in Olympic National Park. So um, our migrating salmon into the park is, is an important aspect of this natural habitat. So I want to highlight a plan that came from the project of SQUIM and it's storm capture, storm water capture and infiltration. Um, I like this as an example because it's harnessing green infrastructure to address two different hazards that are deeply interrelated in this case. So you see here, this is a zoom in of uh, just, just south of the city. Stor they're gonna capture storm water in this area. The high flow events flood out a lot of these areas in the surface. They're gonna capture it. 
They're going to convey it to a, about a 300 acre um, chunk of uh, forest land, county owned forest land, that eventually is going to be a county park and it's also going to be a future reservoir site. They're going to use infiltration trenches and green infrastructure to allow that captured water to naturally sink down in and re-infiltrate the aquifer that they rely on for drinking water. Um, so this is a classic um, you know, flood diversion and storage um, project. This, this yellow uh, lines could be considered as a phase one with the reservoir eventually be considered as a phase two. And I wanted to, to just make note of the uh, one of the statements, overall summary statements that was submitted. This project was submitted to FEMA, as I said, and we're awaiting funding on it. But this is an, an excellent summary statement of what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Capture stormwater southwest of the city to alleviate flooding problems and infiltrate it using green infrastructure to fortify the aquifer and improve resilience of drinking water supplies for thousands. And that gets, that's getting close to kind of why I'm highlighting this today. Um, so SQUIM's increasing their resiliency to changing conditions by doing a couple of things, one in the planning world and one in the interconnected in the project world. So they're using their planning efforts to assess linkages and connections of hazards like floods and droughts. A lot of communities aren't connecting those dots as much. Some watersheds, are, you know, every watershed is maybe a little different. In their case, in SQUIM's case, the high flow and low flow events can be addressed through multi-hazard projects that achieve long-term risk reduction for both hazards and also achieve co-benefits for the whole community. So I want to talk a little bit about those hazards and about co-benefits. Um, mitigation plans are well equipped to address and assess disaster cycles and cascading effects. I'm, I'm sorry if this is simplistic for some of these, for some of the, the <laughs> climatologists on the uh, on the call, but I just want to go over this briefly. You know, drought. None of these wild, none of these hazards in a watershed stand alone or are isolated. Droughts um, exacerbate conditions that create uh, help create wildfires, forest infestations, which of course um, contribute to flooding, uh, flash flooding, and soil erosion. And the whole thing is this kind of nasty cycle that eventually, for humans results in loss of natural, economic, and social capital. Um, and, and so how are droughts really fueling this? You know, they're pushing risk thresholds. Uh, they're, the cascading effects of these can establish repetitive disaster cycles that can be very difficult to, to break. And of course, climate change is, is helping fuel all these this cycle by increasing the chances of coincident extremes. So mitigation plans, um, they're, they're by nature, they're multi-hazard. Um, so they're looking at a number of different hazards. And for that reason, they can, they can help address, at least at the planning level, some of these disaster cycles and cascading effects. And I wanna talk about the projects that can come from those plans. We're seeing plans like the one in SQUIM, like levy setbacks that are more and more when they're going, coming up for funding competitively, they're highlighting the co-benefits that, that will de be derived um, from the initial activity. So you see the, uh, an example here of a levee setback. Pretty standard flood control project, uses green infrastructure certainly. So, you know, the wetland habitat is, is improved, increased flood capacity, which has its own obvious um, benefits. But then of, of course, you slow water down into wetlands and you allow aquifers below it to recharge. And that in turn develops water security and even water redundancy for the communities that rely on it. And of course, that is, is a positive feedback loop, a positive cascade of co-benefits like increased natural, economic, and social capital. So properly designed projects like this can have really significant long-term mitigation or drought mitigation co-benefits. And in fact, if you look at it from a cost-effectiveness standpoint, some of those co-benefits that are down the line far exceed or outweigh the cost of the original project. And that was the case certainly in the SQUIM project, or will be. So three key takeaways here. I know I covered a lot of ground fairly quickly, but um, I want to respect your time. So the first key takeaway is, you know, from my perspective, what I'm seeing is multi-hazard mitigation planning and the plan processes in communities are yielding really good opportunities for the communities to get together with stakeholders and develop risk reduction projects with these co-benefits built in, not by accident, but intentionally. 
And it's that intention to, to achieve co-benefits that's really um, different from what I've noticed in the past. And then secondly, of course, like the SQUIM example, applying green infrastructure techniques in flood mitigation projects for, high, for these high flow events can yield measurable long-term drought co-benefits, which is very cool, for especially for grant funding purposes. <laughs> And of course, the third one is probably the most important one. If you're looking from some actual blue sky and sunshine in Western Washington, try SQUIM. So that's all, it looks like my time is up. I can thank you for your time. I can pass it back to Britt or if you have any questions. All right, thank you so much, Tim. All right, I don't see any questions. Um, so let's move right on to Adrian, our final speaker. Hi, can you hear me okay? This is Adrian. Yes, we can. Great. So, hi everyone. It's been really interesting to hear the presentation so far. Um, I'm going to be looking further ahead into the future, talking about climate change and snow in the western U.S. And I'm talking about two recently published studies, one on the um, changing interannual variability and one on snowfall intensity. Uh, before I really get started, I want to acknowledge my co-authors on these studies, Tim Link, um, John Abatsoglu, who you heard from earlier, Chris Tennant, and Andrew Robinson, uh, with funding from the National Science Foundation. Oops. So I mentioned I'm talking about uh, two major topics. One is changes in interannual variability, and the other is changes in snowfall intensity. And these are both uh, broadly motivated by the idea that we know quite a bit about changing uh, average snowpack conditions, but there's a lot more to understand about changing variability in space and time. Um, and I wanna highlight that I can talk a bit about why these types of impacts might matter, but I'm excited to present to this audience because um, it's great to have a diverse body of experts in different systems because I think that diversity is really needed to understand how these changes affect the systems that you all live in, manage, and study. So to dive into interannual variability, the motivation here is that changes in average conditions are relatively well understood, but changes in variability are not as well understood and might have important social and ecological consequences. When I say interannual variability in this case, I'm thinking about changes from year to year. Um, and we define interannual variability as interquartile range for these purposes. So that's the 75th percentile for minus the 25th percentile. You can also think of it as the spread of the middle 50% of years. Uh, here's a hypothetical distribution of peak snow water equivalent or SWE values over 30 years where we have a historic case in blue, um, and those two white lines are showing uh, the 75th and 25th percentile values. So that blue bar at the bottom is showing uh, the historical interquartile range. And in this case, in the future hypothetical case, we get a smaller interquartile range in the red uh, scenario for RCP 8.5. The data we use here is climate data from the Integrated Scenarios Project, which is a great, um, really useful, publicly available data set that I'll describe here. Uh, so they took 10 global climate models from the fifth coupled model intercomparison project. Um, the scenario we took here is RCP 8.5, which is a high emissions scenario. We compared two time periods looking at the late 20th century compared to 2050 to 79 in the future. Um, it was downscaled to a 1 16th degree resolution. So picture grid cells that are about uh, around six kilometers on a side using the MACA algorithm. Um, and then that climate data was used as forcing to the variable infiltration capacity model, uh, which gives us modeled um, snowpack outputs. Uh, here's just a screenshot of the site. It is, like I said, a really useful data resource. So if we look at historical interannual variability defined as interquartile range of peak snow water equivalent across the western U.S., we see the highest values um, mostly in the Maritime Cascades and Sierra Nevada. 
When we look at uh, future changes in interannual variability, interquartile range, this is averaged across 10 global climate models, and we see some pretty large decreases in interquartile range of peak snow water equivalent in the foothills of the Cascades and Sierra Nevada, um, with some increases in the cooler continental interior as well as the high elevation Sierra Nevada. Uh, but then we might ask, if we look across different climate models, how confident can we be that these changes are robust across models? And that's what this figure here is aiming to answer. So here uh, we're essentially asking the question, do at least 50% of climate models agree that future variability will be significantly different from past variability? And really the place where we see um, confidence across GCMs is that in that decrease in interannual variability of peak SWE in the lower elevation Cascades in Sierra Nevada, as well as some of uh, North Idaho. Another type of interannual variability we looked at in this uh, project was multi-year snow drought. So here we define snow drought as years where um, peak SWE is less than the 25th percentile of the historical value. Uh, you know, Tim mentioned warm and dry um, drought types. So this metric we use encompasses both warm and dry snow drought. It doesn't distinguish between the two. And we looked specifically at multi-year snow drought of at least two years in a row. So we calculated this as uh, how frequent is it that both in the current water year and the preceding water year, a given grid cell met this uh, snow drought um, criteria. So if we look at this multi-year snow drought, on average across the Western US, historically, we saw that it was six or 7% of years without a lot of spatial variability. Um, and when we look at changes in that multi-year snow drought, on average, uh, we get to around 42% um, of years in the future scenario, with some of the biggest changes in the Cascades as well as um, North Idaho and Northern California. When we look at our confidence across climate models here, we see that over a very large part of our spatial domain, at least 50% of GCMs agree on an increase in multi-year snow drought. Um, I'll add that in this project, we also looked at changes in timing of peak snow water equivalent, uh, but I'm not gonna go into that today for time concerns. More details are available. We published this paper last year in Geophysical Research Letters uh, in 2019. So the second thing I wanted to talk about here is snowfall intensity. <clears throat> There's previous physically based modeling work that suggests that snowfall intensity may affect winter ablation due to some changes in snowpack energy balance thermodynamics. So this has been shown in models, but not previously in observational data. We know broadly that across the Western US, um, precipitation intensity is generally increasing with climate change. Uh, this is a figure on the right from the fourth national climate assessment. Um, but I want to point out that much less is known about snowfall intensity. So here, in order to look at how snowfall intensity is associated with winter snow melt, we took a statistical modeling approach using snow tell sites across the western U.S. as well as some snow pillows from the California Department of Water Resources. And we modeled winter snow melt as a function of snowfall intensity and winter temperatures. We defined snowfall intensity as a simple daily intensity index, which is one of the Climdex metrics, um, and its total precip accumulation divided by the number of days on which precipitation occurred. And here we applied it only to uh, snow water equivalent accumulation. Our results suggest, uh, as we expected based on the physically based modeling, that snowfall intensity does appear to affect uh, winter melt. So in this contour plot on the right, we're showing our model results where we see it that the warmest temperatures and the lowest uh, snowfall intensity values is where we tend to see the highest winter ablation of snow. We might then want to know um, what does this mean for our expectations of future scenarios? Our approach here was to apply the same statistical modeling framework to the integrated scenarios data that I mentioned earlier uh, and then assess projected changes in winter ablation with and without trends in snowfall intensity. 
So the figure here is showing projected changes in each of the variables we use in this model. Um, we have accumulation season or winter melt on the left, generally increasing across the study domain, uh, winter temperatures increasing, and then our snowfall intensity metric. We see increasing in uh, the cooler continental interior and generally decreasing, that's the green, in the maritime western part of the spatial domain. Our results with the model data uh, looking at these contour plots are broadly similar to what we saw in the empirical data, which is comforting. It's nice to see that the models are generally reproducing some of the patterns we saw in observational data. And when we use our model in the future projected data to try to understand how is changing snowfall intensity um, affecting estimates of future winter ablation, in general, in the cooler continental interior, um, because we're seeing increases in snowfall intensity, those are generally mitigating the effects of warming on uh, projected changes in melt, and the opposite is true in the Cascades and most of the Sierra Nevada. Uh, this paper was just published a few weeks ago, also in Geophysical Research Letters, if you want more details. And I'll wrap up with some conclusions here. Um, with respect to interannual variability, uh, we're showing a decreased interannual variability of peak snow water equivalent in future climate scenarios. Um, as, and that's really as we lose some of the highest water years. And again, that's spatially variable with uh, more frequent multi-year snow droughts. When we look at changing snowfall intensity, uh, we see in the empirical record that there's higher snowfall intensity associated with less winter melt and that the projected changes in snowfall intensity will tend to exacerbate uh, changes in winter melt in the maritime regions and reduce the impacts of warming on winter melt in continental uh, regions in the high elevation Southern Sierra, Sierra Nevada. Um, that's it, thanks so much for your time and interest and I'll hand it back to the organizers. All right, thank you, Adrian. Uh, so if anybody has questions, please type them into the question box and uh, we'll uh, take a few questions for the speakers. Um, so there was uh, a question for Tim, um, and the question is, would SQUIM have a water conservation plan to accompany this plan to recharge the aquifer? Ah, great question. I would assume so. I would defer to... Um, and I believe there's at least one person in, uh, locally from that area on the call, so I would defer to them. But I, I certainly believe so. I've read the capital improvements plan for the water system, and they this project is identified there. Um, so yes, I would assume it. The conservation, water conservation, is a, a very big topic in the hazard mitigation planning documents I've read. And in fact, that's kind of common. It's nice to actually see projects that target increased water storage and water redundancy of sources over just the standard hey we're going to ask residents to conserve water um, we all know that agriculture and, and non-residential water use comprises the vast majority of our uh, or consumes the vast majority of our of our water so it's nice to see projects that address that um, that, that need on a larger scale but i would defer to to uh, ann or, or anyone else uh, city level or the county level to address your specific question. Thanks, Tim. Um, a question uh, for you, John. Um, there was a question about uh, a lot of gray displayed on the snow water equivalent maps. Um, and, and what do those gray areas mean? Does it mean no data um, specifically with respect to uh, the Olympics um, and trying to understand the, the data gaps there on the west side. Uh, for example, there's only three snow tail sites for the Olympics. Can you comment a little bit more on that, John? Yeah, so it depends on which figure we were looking at, but um, one of the upshots at least of, of having different ways of, of looking at SWE, snow water equivalent, we have a couple gridded products. One gridded product comes from the University of Washington that runs this variable infiltration capacity model. Um, and on the toolbox, we're only showing areas that have 
a certain amount of snow water equivalent. But nonetheless, we're able to sort of, you know, map out um, sweep, you know, percentiles uh, across a larger geographic range than just the, the snow tell stations. So um, areas that might be gray or either there's not enough snow there for reliable statistics um, or some sort of artifact that's just not coming through in my individuals. All right, thank you. And if you have any, um, if anyone has any particular specific questions about their area, feel free to reach out to the speakers directly. Their contact information is up on the screen now. And we have just a couple more minutes for any other questions. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us today and a recording will be available on drought.gov later this week. And again, if you're interested in the PDFs of the presentations, you can email Britt Parker. And um, please mark your calendars for the next webinar on April 27th. Thanks, and then, everybody. Megan, this is Britt. It looks oh. like you did have one other question come in. Oh, there is. Oh, the okay. recording. Well, I'm sorry. I think you oh, <laughs> oh, where can we find the recording for the webinars? Um, on drop.gov later this week. Yes, and everyone right, on uh, the webinar will also join. get an email with the recording, so that always follows the um, in via email. Great. All right, have a good rest of your day, everybody.